Hey, Mountain. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Glad you're with us. If you're a guest, and a special hello to everyone at whatever campus you might be at, Edgewood. Hello, Bel Air, Abingdon, Mountain Road, online, wherever you are. Glad you're with us. Hey, you know what it is? It's, it's Super Bowl weekend, y'all. So there's a ton of enthusiasm. It's the Rams and the, uh, what's those other guys? Patriots, yeah. How many of you want the Patriots to win? Yeah. Brave, the brave, the brave five here at Mountain Road anyway. How many of you would put money on the Rams to win? Even fewer. Even fewer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. You know, um, Tom Brady, of course, quarterback for the, uh, the Patriots, has been called the, the greatest of all time, the, the GOAT. So that makes this Super Bowl the Rams and the GOAT. And I know that a lot of you have been eagerly anticipating whether or not I might hear a word from God about today's game, as has been our custom. And I'm happy to tell you, I didn't think it was going to happen, but this morning I got out of bed. And the first thing I did is I actually dropped my Bible on the floor, and behold, it felleth open to Ezekiel 34, 17, which saith, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I will judge between the rams and goats. And I said, I know, Lord, I know you will, and you're sovereign in all things, but which way will you judge, I wonder, between the ram and the goat? And just then, as I held the very text in my hand, the, the spirit didst ruffle the pages of my Bible, and would you believe it fell open to Daniel 8, 7. Look at this. Look at this. The goat charged furiously at the ram and struck him, breaking both of his horns. Now the ram was helpless, and the goat knocked him down and trampled him, and no one could rescue the ram from the goat's power. Right there in the Bible. I said, Lord, surely this is bad news. How can I know that the Rams won't come back at the last second and win? And at just that very moment, I was led to Exodus 29, which when I saw it says, and thou shalt slay the ram and cut the ram to pieces. So it's right there in the Bible. <laughs> the Rams are going to get killed. I even, I even had a flash of prophetic insight about the score. We know the Rams are going to put up about 28 points, but it says in Numbers 7, that about some stuff about oxen, and it says Rams 12. So 28, 12, <laughs> there you go. You heard it right here straight from the Bible. Welcome if you're a guest. This is how we preach around here. So, All right. I grew up, I grew up in a home where I was the youngest of four kids. Uh, how many of you are the youngest in your families? Yeah, we're special, aren't we? Yes, we are. I know all of our siblings think we're spoiled, but we know different. We know, how, like road trips when you're little. And I'm not talking about today, kids getting their, like, executive suite, little first class section of the minivan, you know, with a little video console and cup and the air conditioning and whatever. No, no, no. We're talking about all six of us jamming in the back of Dad's Chevy, right? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, we're just like slam them in there, and uh, mom and dad, there's no air conditioning, there's no nothing. Mom and dad are up front with Kathy, and I'm in the back with my two older brothers, and guess where I sit? Where do I sit? I'm in the middle on the what? Hump. On the hump. Tell the younger children what the hump is. <laughs> there I am holding the dog, and then you know the seat has the little, that little vinyl strip, that decorative strip in the middle. It's about 12 to 18 inches wide, and that's where my hiney was, and my brother would be like, that line right there, don't go over that line. My other brother on the other side, like, don't go over that line. I'm like, so here I am sitting there. That's my spot. If you breathe on me, if you touch me, if you look at me, if you drool on me, there's going to be trouble. So there I am. I'm just sitting on the hump, right? That's how it is. Benny's touching me. Oh, there was going to be a problem if, uh, if Benny was <laughs> touching. My dad, once in a while, he'd, he'd, he'd say... Um, He'd say if it got too loud and, you know, the boys start going at it in the back, you know, he'd be like, you boys dry up. Like our big problem is a moisture issue or something. I, I never understood that, but I, I know what it meant, you know, dry up. And if, it did, and if we didn't dry up, then all of a sudden he'd like, you know how this works, he like could sublux his shoulder and throw it out of joint and suddenly he's in the back seat like <laughs> trying to grab a hold of something. And you're like dodging and weaving. And, he's, and then he says what all dads say, do I need to... Do I need to pull over? Do I need to stop this car? And you're like, well, if it's that or crash, yes. I mean, we're swerving everywhere. So we had very clear boundaries back there. There's the line. Don't go over it. And families have boundaries like that, don't they? Now, they're not always as clear 
as they were in the back seat for me as a kid. You've got some boundaries in your family. Families are, are awesome. They are the source of some of our greatest joys and happiest memories, aren't they? Best times in life sometimes are with family, but also some of our great frustrations and deepest hurts and some confusion and frustration comes from families as well. And a lot of this has to do with this boundary issue, this fuzziness, this sense of how to get along, where to draw lines that everyone can live with. We've been talking about, we've been calling this series Pushing the Limits. And it's all about how to just take some basic godly wisdom from Scripture and do it so life works right. Like try it God's way. And we started with Luke kind of walking us through, just reminding us how limits are life-giving and how from the Old Testament Scriptures and all the way through the New, you've got this idea, this concept of limits, and we think it's going to hem, hem, hem us in, and it'll be really hard for us, but it ends up being the very best gift in the world for us. And so there's a sense of trusting God. So we want to trust his sense of limits. And we talked about boundaries in relationships. And then we talked about boundaries with our time. Remember the, the big rocks in first? And then we talked last week with Jared about boundaries in our bodies, especially when it comes to sleep and food and sex. And today we want to talk about boundaries with our families. Boundaries with our families, because what we want is, whether we're in the backseat of a car or whatever, wh wherever we are, we want, um, we want a healthy sense of living so life works with God's principles. And, I don't, and whether you're a brother or a sister living at home with some siblings, or you're, you've got kids of your own, or you're empty nesters, or you're single, or divorced, or fostering, or blended, or live alone, or wherever we are, I think we can use some help with this. Remember now, when we talk about boundary, we just simply say it's a line that gets drawn. And you've got to fall in the right place. And a line that gets drawn that says, okay, this is me. This is me and my stuff. And that over there, that's you. And we kind of live there. This is my responsibility. That's your responsibility. This is my stuff. That's your stuff. Like the walls of a house. And if somebody just kind of walks in the house and starts taking stuff or without permission or whatever, that's a boundary issue. You've got to figure out how to put a boundary up. And if you've ever felt like relationships and families can be kind of tricky or frustrating, if you've ever felt kind of maybe disrespected by someone in your family or like your little ones just never, ever obey or the older ones maybe speak in ways that concern you or if you're a kid and you feel like mom and dad just don't get you, they baby, they baby you or they expect more of you than you think you can do or you get angry with your partner about the same thing they repeatedly do that bothers you and it's getting worse. Or in your family, you have the same arguments about the same things over and over and over again. And then same kind of destructive behavior keeps happening. You know, they, these, are, these are boundary things. And what we want in our families, as we said before, is we, we want to invite the love of God. The love of God, Jeremiah 3.13 says, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. A reminder of so many places in the Bible where God's love is different. It's, it's permanent. It's beautiful. It's pure. It's good. It's true. The New Testament says perfect love casts out fear. And we want that in our families. Families, don't we? And so many of our relationships and families are marked by fear. If I don't give the kids what they want, they're going to throw a tantrum. It's going to be a terrible day. I'll just do it. I don't want to do this, or she might get mad, or he'll give me the silent treatment, or he might sort of blow a cast, you know, a gasket or something. And so we live in this fear. And what we want and what we need is the love of God, this everlasting love that comes to us through Jesus Christ, that we can access through the way we have been loved and filled so that it can flow just not to us but through us and be people who know how to live in healthy ways, in pure ways, in good ways, in life-giving ways that go past some of the manipulative, selfish, sort of inward guilt trip, passive-aggressive, dysfunctional sin patterns that were handed to us or that we grew up or adopted or learned to use somewhere along life's path. We're talking about growing up. And we're talking about how that could look in a family so we could love with an everlasting love. And it starts with some of this boundary stuff. I, I, I think of Proverbs 4.23, that verse that just talks about how it's important above everything else you do to guard your heart because it, everything you do flows out of that deep place inside of you. And if it gets impure and cluttered and all kind of messed up, then your marriage won't be great, your parenting won't be great, your relationships with your friends and siblings, your faith, your job, everything will be off if the heart inside. So that's your 
responsibility to live your life in a sort of mature way where you stop blaming everything on everyone else, take responsibility and say, how can I live a boundary life that honors God? So we can love God, love people, serve the world. Now, in families, we run up against all kind of stuff. People, people don't always sit in their little vinyl strip. And, and uh, so, quick reminder, some of the things you might run into in a family, and we've talked about some of these, and you can think about them through a family lens now. But so, sometimes you run into someone who's kind of out of control. They're out of control maybe because of an addiction or some kind of compulsive behavior that really has control of them, so they're really not in control. So they, they just run roughshod over everyone's boundaries because that addiction, that alcohol, that booze, that drug, that, uh, that porn, or that food, whatever it is, is really kind of running their life. And they may apologize and mean well, but they're just going to keep doing it as long as that thing's in control. And what often happens is that someone in the family, maybe you, kind of doesn't want them to hurt like that or doesn't want to see the damage that's happening, and so you try to make it stop. You try to help them. And families become then these breeding grounds for, for what we have come to call codependent relationships where you try to fix, you try to rescue, you say, I will be God, I will be Jesus, I will rescue, I will save you. But in the process, because we're not Jesus, we end up enabling the person to keep doing the very thing that's hurting them and us. It's a horrible loop to get stuck in, isn't it? Because it really doesn't help the person, doesn't help you. And until the pain of that situation becomes greater than the payoff of what everyone's getting out of that dysfunctional arrangement, it's just going to keep going and nothing will change. But if it gets bad enough, you start calling out to God in some moments of frustration. Sometimes resolve gets clear enough, and that's when you can set a boundary and say, you know what, I'm not going to help you kill yourself. I'm not going to rescue you. I'm not going to be mean to you. I'm not going to, I'm going to still love you. I'm not going to withhold my love, but I tell you, the way this love is going to come across right now is I'm going to draw a boundary, and I'm not going to bail you out. I'm not going to pick you up. I'm not going to give you a drive, a ride. I'm not going to lie for you. I'm not going to write that note. I'm not going to give you that loan. So sometimes we run into some people that's out of control, and boundaries can help us love better. Sometimes we run into prob another problem is in families that some of us can't say no. How many of you know someone that can't say no? Yeah, if you're raising your hand, you might be that person. So because you just said yes. Anyway, um, but no, this is a person. When, when a person can't say no, that's a boundary issue because you just, you, sometimes boundaries keep bad things out, but some uh, boundaries, um, boundaries when, you don't, when you can't say no, you can't do that. They just, everything can come in. You don't have any boundary there. So you think it's impolite or rude or you know, maybe you're a Jesus follower and you're like, you know, aren't we supposed to love everyone, give the shirt off our back? And it's hard sometimes to know how to be caring but not, you know, give yourself away or be trampled on. And sometimes people like this, they just melt at any request and the demands of other people and their mouths say yes and inside they're thinking, I can't believe I said that because they don't want to do it and they're conflicted and it's not healthy or honest, but it's the way it is and they're driven by fear usually. Fear of hurting someone's feelings. Fear of what they might say of me if I, if I don't say yes right now. Fear of, I, I hate feeling guilty and I don't want to feel guilt, so I'll say yes, even though I hate saying yes. And if you want to manipulate a person like this, you just use little catchphrases like, if you love me, you would, and you got them. Or if, you know, if I had the money, I'd do it for you. Or you call yourself a Christian, right? Well, that'll get them. Sometimes you run into somebody yeah, who, who's got another issue, and, they're, and they're, it's a person who's a controller. A controller is a person who, even when you say no, they just they don't take that for an answer. They just barge right through the front door anyway. And uh, they just take it as their responsibility to try to talk you into it. you got to help me out here. So they manipulate. They might yell. They might get angry. They might use violence. They might use guilt. They use whatever uh, they need to. So I'm just trying to remind us, poke around a little bit on us, remind us, can we all just acknowledge we're all a little bit screwed up? Yep. And guess what? You're the only one here who has those problems. <laughs> Not true. So how, how can all of us sort of get back on this horse of some boundaries in the area of families? Let me give you some things, uh, these biblical principles. And again, we're not following a straight text through. We're kind of jumping around, just grabbing biblical principles to try to get some help in our families today. One thing I would say as you think about families, is we've got to get better at loving without rescuing. We've got to love others without rescuing them. There's a difference, and sometimes it's hard to figure it out. We, we've got to learn to see the difference between true love and a codependent or rescuing love. 
Because that, that rescuing love doesn't cast out any fear. It just sort of temporarily put a Band-Aid on something. Love says, I'm for you, and I'm on your team. But I'm not going to try to fix your problems. I can't. That's a boundary issue. Take a look at Galatians 6, a passage we've looked at before, but I, I noticed something interesting in this one uh, this time. I'm going to kind of sk skip around and start in verse 2. It starts out, Paul's giving this beautiful thing, this word to us and to the Galatians, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. There's nothing more Christ-like you can do than sort of help each other with the hard things in life. Carry each other's burdens, right? But then look, a couple of verses later, he ends the same sentence. I took all the rest out so you could see it. He ends by saying, for each one should carry their own load. Does anybody see anything weird here? Carry each other's burdens. Carry your own load. Which is it? And how does that go together? I noticed something when I dug in a little bit. Carry each other's burdens. The word burden there is a word that kind of means a, a, like a big boulder, a huge back-crushing rock that you can't carry by yourself. And these are the kind of things we got to help each other with. A divorce is a boulder. Your kid gets really sick for a long time. That's a boulder. Your house gets foreclosed or damaged by flood or fire or something like that. A medical condition or some emotional illness. Sometimes we've got to come alongside. That's why we talk about you know, being together in community so often around here. And in families, we've got to sometimes get under the rock so it doesn't crush them, carry each other's boulders but then did you know that word that's usually translated load carry your own load doesn't mean boulder it means it's a word that kind of it basically means like knapsack like your daily pack you would take for a hike with the stuff that you're going to need for that day it's your stuff that you'll need your daily stuff carry your own knapsack life goes well I think scripture is saying here, when we help others with their boulders, but goes poorly when we start picking up other people's knapsacks. Because God never intended us, to, there is a sort of differentiation, there's a boundary there. God never intended you to fix someone else's attitude or their emotions or all of their problems because you're not Jesus. Even Jesus doesn't do that for us. How many of you tried to make a miserable, per miserable person happy? Have you ever tried to do that? How's that working out for you? Yeah, isn't it funny? You think, wow, I'm happy and they're miserable. I'll make them happy. Guess what happens? You're both miserable. <laughs> That's how that works. If you're not sure whether you're loving or rescuing someone, maybe just ask yourself this question. Is this something they should be doing for themselves? That's a great question. It'll, it'll elucidate. Because sometimes when we think we're rescuing, we're actually robbing them of the experience they need, the frustration they need to learn to set a boundary. But they never have to because we keep rescuing and robbing them of that opportunity. We always want to jump in, whether it's with our kids or our spouses or others, and kind of excusing their behavior. So you, you want to keep asking, you know, is this something they should just be learning to do for themselves? Is this in their knapsack or is this a boulder? Getting a job? Getting sober? Solving their financial problems, dealing with their anger, taking care of their bodies. These are, these are, these are things on them. And healthy families learn to love that way without rescuing. Another thing we can do is to learn to say no when that's the right thing to say. I love the simplicity of Jesus when he says in Matthew 5, it's like, all you need to say sometimes is simply yes or no. In other words, there's a, there's a line that you can draw. And sometimes, I love what John Townsend said here. To say, if you say no and someone doesn't respect that, there's five other words you can use that really kind of help. Here they are. Ready? That doesn't work for me. Try that one. It, it really does help. What do you mean no? Why? You can say, well, because that tone of voice doesn't work for me. Or because those hurtful words, that doesn't work for me. Or that's an inappropriate behavior and that doesn't work for me. There's a lot of attention today on how no means no. I think it might be kind of a good thing for us to pay attention to that. Here's another one. Don't shield the ones you love from the consequences of their actions. Don't shield them. 
You have an angry management person in your family, ang- anger, anger person, and you learn, they teach you that when they get angry, you start walking on eggshells. Well, they've successfully taught you, but you've never really maybe held them accountable, so you don't have to sort of shout back or anything, but you could just let them experience some consequences of their actions. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. Beautiful section of scripture here. We're just going to drop down verses 10 and 11. It's kind of making an analogy here about God's care for us. And, and it starts out by making a, talking about us and human families. For our earthly fathers and mothers disciplined us for a u- few years when we were young, right? Doing the best they knew how. How many of you feel like, well, my folks did the best they knew how? Sometimes they got it right and sometimes not so much, right? Like my dad when he said, you know, stop running in circles or I'll nail your other foot to the floor. <laughs> you know, sometimes parents get it right, sometimes they don't. Okay, so... You say, okay, we all get that. But God's discipline, God's discipline now, oh my goodness, it's always good for us. So that we might share in his holiness. Like, in other words, the purpose of it, so that means, you know, it means there's a purpose here for God's discipline. And it says, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, Get past the pain and there will be a peaceful harvest of right living. Don't we need that in our families? A peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So we need the training that comes from the consequences even if it's painful because that's how you get to the peaceful harvest in families. So stop shielding one another from these consequences. The Bible says in Galatians right after these verses, what you, what you reap, you will sow. What you plant is supposed to come back to you. So don't quit intercepting all of that for everyone. We're, we're, we're interrupting process. Now just a quick sidebar here for parents on discipline issues. As we look at this one passage about God's discipline of us, you know, it, the focus of discipline, it, it's, not, it's not punishment. Don't punish your kids. The focus of discipline is not punitive, it's formative, you see? It's it's not about punishing the child, it's about helping them learn and grow. It's not about what you did, it's about who you are becoming. It's not looking in the past, it's looking in the future. And so we, we plan the discipline in a way that will help them become who they need to be as a result of this beautiful opportunity of failure or mistake or uh, a sin that they've committed or whatever they've done. And it may not be fun at the time, but it does what it's supposed to do. If you're struggling with this in, in, in actual family life then, one of the things that can help us is to remember the difference between hurt and harm. You see the difference? Between something that hurts and something that harms. When I was in first grade, we lived in Minneapolis and went out to the garage all by myself with a big old box of Ohio blue tip matches because they were awesome. Those wooden things, you could light them, you could throw them, you could kind of like burn them upside down, and then they're still smoldering. I put them on top of this can. I just kept lighting them. I was having a great time for about half an hour. I put them on top of this can. The can, by the way, was a five gallon can of gasoline. <laughs> I had no idea what kind of danger I was in. Having a good old time. My dad walks in. He didn't say, oh, let's have a chat and put you in time out. <laughs> no. No, he did not. He moved very quickly and he grabbed me with some kind of, you know, something that was commensurate to the potential for the danger that we were in. And um, I don't remember my dad spanking me that much. Maybe only this one time. But he spanked me that day. In fact, what did the verse say? No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It is painful. The Bible's true. I can, I can tell you the Bible's true. <laughs> All right, question. Did it hurt? Yes, did it harm me? No, don't let any psychobabbler tell you it harmed me. It did not. In fact, it, it would prevent future harm. You go to the dentist, you have, a, you have a cavity pulled out. Does it hurt? Yes. Yeah. Did it harm you? No. Friends, listen, not everything that's good for you feels good. Not everything that hurts you is bad for you. And we're so slow to get it, but it's jammed into it's so many places in the Bible. And when someone comes at you with a manipulative, how could you? This is hurting me. You don't love me. You know better because you have the example of God through Christ. You have the example of a, of a, of a disciplining father who's not trying to be punitive. He's trying to be formative. He's not trying to hurt you. He's he, harm you or hurt you, but he's going to help you grow. 
And so what you sow, you should reap. And we're so busy swooping in. And sometimes the hand of natural consequences is coming in for a little swat on the rear. And we run in and like, oh, no, 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 no. Let them light their matches. We don't want to hurt their feelings. Let the consequences come as hard as it may be. Your little three-year-old keeps hitting little sister on the head. Bonking her, bonking her, bonking her. And you say, oh, Johnny, don't do that. You might hurt her feelings and joggle her brains out. What's he going to do? Well, he's going to keep hitting her on the head. Why wouldn't he? So you need some boundaries there. Someone's got to take control of that situation because he's not responsible yet for his own boundaries at that level. So you, you help put some there. You put him in timeout. You take away a privilege. You say you keep that up. There won't be any ice cream for you after dinner. You've got to make it hurt. You're not going to harm him. And you need to do this. Stop shielding him from that. Stop being so worried about his esteem that you're destroying his character. Not just for his sister's sake so she doesn't get her brains joggled out. Not just for your sake so you don't have a misbehaving kid, but for the kid's sake. The kid deserves someone to help him understand that limits actually give life. And that it's better when you live a life when you're not bashing your sister's head in. And if he doesn't figure it out at age three, you're going to have an ugly little five-year-old on your hands. And if you don't figure it out at five, you're going to have a ten-year-old you don't want in the house. And if you don't figure it out at ten, you're going to have trouble at 15. And that's the kind of kid who grows up and becomes 25 in an adult body, but he's still three years old. And some of you know exactly who I'm talking about. So don't rob others of what they need to learn by shielding them from the consequences of their own actions. That's their knapsack. Let them feel the weight of it. It may be hard. It may hurt you to, to watch them hurt. But it's not going to harm them. It's going to help them and it's going to heal them. Let's talk a little bit about marriage. Boundaries in marriage. So much we could say, not much time to say it. I think of Ephesians 5, which has all these great words for husbands and wives and our job description there to mirror this kind of loving and mutual submission way we live together. Verse 31, it's been talking about husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives like your own bodies. And it comes down to verse 31. It says, for this reason, quoting Genesis 2, 24 here, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become what? One flesh. I don't understand all that that means, but it's a beautiful mystery. It's talking a little bit about Jesus and the church. It's talking a little bit about husband and wife. But I know this. It, 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 it's a giving up of some separateness in order for something better called one flesh, where you're bound together, moving toward intimacy in the same way that God moves toward us in a kind of vulnerability when God lowered himself and humbled himself, came among us with this perfect everlasting love, husbands and wives get to mirror a little bit of that beautiful thing. John Cloud says, more marriages fall apart because of poor boundaries than for any other reason. When you're, when you're together in a family, in a marriage, and you're trying to have two become one, there's lots of potential for things going wrong. You can stay two separate, that doesn't work. You can get two enmeshed, that doesn't work. You can, you can forget to leave and cleave. And so you got to leave your father and mother before you can cleave. You know, sometimes she wants to run home to mom or daddy, and that doesn't work. And you got all these problems. I thought maybe I would just change up here a little bit and just tell you one thing. I've been married a while. I'll tell you one thing, it's been the most slow for, I've been the slowest to learn in my own marriage and life, but it's been maybe one of the most helpful even though it's maybe not the most important, it might be helpful for you. And that is on this matter of boundaries and moving closer to oneness. Remember, boundaries are not only where you try to, you know, figure out what belongs to someone else. You've got to figure out what belongs to you. Like, what's your own stuff that you need to own? And take responsibility for it. Boundaries promote intimacy because we need the ability to take responsibility for our own, and here's the word I'm getting at, feelings. Now, some of you cringe when I say that word. But we've got to learn to take responsibility. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out what someone else is feeling, but I have a hard enough time trying to figure out what I'm feeling and then take responsibility for that. And when you communicate that, what you're feeling, like a responsible, boundary person should, now you have a chance at intimacy. Without it, you don't. So a couple goes in for counseling and, you know, asks the husband, you know, what's going on or whatever. They're in there because the husband's drinking. And so the counselor asks the wife, hey, how do, how do you feel when he drinks? 
And she says something like, well, I feel like he doesn't even think about what he's doing. I feel like he, blah, blah, and she, he, he, oh, hold on, hold on. Now you're evaluating his drinking now. How do you feel when he drinks? Well, I feel like he doesn't care. I feel like, no, 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 no. That's what you think about him. How do you feel when he drinks? And finally she just begins to cry. She says, I feel scared. I feel alone. I feel sad for our family. Finally, she said what she felt. She owned her own feelings. And he reaches over, puts a hand on her arm and says, I, I never knew. I never thought about you being afraid. I would never want you to feel afraid. And what just happened, there was a breakthrough and a turning point in that relationship because up to that point, she would complain about him and criticize him and, and be angry at him. And he, of course, would respond with defensiveness and why it was her fault and blaming and justifying and all this stuff. They could talk for hours about this thing, but they would talk past each other because neither would just simply talk in a way that would be responsible to own the feelings that are actually there and communicate them. When we start sentences with you always or you this, it's never going to be helpful. When we start with the, the word you, start with the word I and then don't say I think that you. No, it's a, I feel. And when we can say something like that, sad, I feel mad, I feel hurt, I feel scared, I feel like now we're getting into a place of vulnerability that's getting into a Holy Spirit area where now God's going to show up and has a possibility to do something in your marriage. It's the beginning of intimacy and caring, and that's what one flesh, I think, feels like, where we're not hiding behind fig leaves anymore. We're just there with each other, which is why if someone dares to be vulnerable enough to come to you and be vulnerable enough to share, I feel sad or angry, don't please respond in any other way other than a caring, tender, sensitive awareness that this was hard for them to do, and the appropriate answer is not, well, you shouldn't feel that way, or defend yourself, or attack or criti be critical or condemn, because you will have shut down and do damage to the future of that relationship. So this is something that's taken me a long time. I'm still learning. Carl and I are working this out. But you know, it's a boundary issue. You know, even anger is a feeling. And I used to sort of think it was her fault if I got angry because she's the one who made me angry. Guess what? No one can make you angry. And if they do, okay, you're still responsible for what you do with that anger. And the mature thing in a marriage relationship is you come and communicate, I'm angry. You don't like act angry. That's not mature necessarily. You're allowed to act angry, but just don't hurt anybody, right? But you come and communicate it. And if you think your anger is their problem, you're waiting on someone to fix it, you're going to wait a long time. But your responsibility to do something about it and withdrawing or slamming doors, that really doesn't really do anything positive. So we set these boundaries. Not, we're not going to change someone else. Complaining isn't going to do You're part of the problem if you're a nagging spouse. But we accept someone as they are, but then we also aren't afraid to give them consequences if they are. So, so instead of like, stop yelling at me. Be nicer. That's the old way. You get a boundaried way. You say, you can continue to yell like that, but I'm not going to be in your presence when you do it. So excuse me. When you want to talk, I'm all about that. I'll be over here. Or you've got to stop your drinking. You're wrecking our lives. You're ruining our family. That's an old way without any boundaries. You can say, you can choose to drink if you want to, but I'm not going to expose the kids and me to that. And so the next time you're drunk on a Friday night, um, we're going to be at the Wilsons, and I'll tell them why we're there. You can drink if you want, but I can also choose what I'm going to do. So that's healthy boundaries. It's a way that love comes out sometimes. And we've got to preserve our relationships from being destructive. Let me just give you one last thing that I think is a little secret nugget that God gave to every marriage that sort of keeps it going through all of the boundary problems. You've got these two imperfect people thrown together. How are you going to get along? God gave us a little secret, a little weapon. You know what it is? Forgiveness. It's not the answer to everything. And if you mis if misapply forgiveness, you'll end up just being trampled. But I can just tell you this. Forgiveness is a beautiful gift because it moves us forward where we need to move forward. And it's a boundary thing. It says there was a line and you stepped over it. Jesus says go right to the person and tell them straight up what happened. That's a boundary. You say you hurt me. You took that. This is what happened. You don't run from it. You don't blame them. You just say this is what it is. And that, for that, you owe me. But I am choosing now to cancel that debt, and the whole thing is gone. Only takes one person to forgive. You don't need the other person's permission. They don't even have to be alive. 
It takes two to reconcile. And there's another issue of building trust. But forgiveness is beautiful because it's you saying, I'm drawing a boundary and I'm no longer going to let that person come into my headspace by my being angry, hurt, and upset. I'm actually forgiving all that. I'm letting it go. You refuse to forgive? Well, you're still a servant to that offense. And that's a boundary issue. You've let someone in you shouldn't let in. So forgiveness is a beautiful tool. And I encourage you to use it in spades. Let's just close with a couple things maybe about kids. Boundaries and kids. Wow, there's a lot we could say here. I'm going to do my best not to go on a rant. <laughs> but I think of things, I think of things like Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 says, fathers and mothers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. We want these godly, this godly understanding. From the time we get a kid that gets handed into your arms as an infant newborn or a, new, a fresh adopted child you bring home or whatever the case may be, we've got one job, and it is not to sort of make sure that that kid makes me feel good or dress them cute so I feel like we have fun vacations and can post stuff on Instagram. The kid's job is not to do chores around the house or to sort of make me feel good or live my sports life vicariously through them. The one job of every parent who comes under the banner of Christ is to, is to help nourish, raise, and instruct and guide this child in a way that they will emerge out of our nest as a responsible, mature, grounded, Christ-loving, church-supporting, healthy human being who can live their life according to the call God places on their life. That's it. We're letting them go from the minute God puts them in our hands. And there's a lot of different ideas about how to do that. And if I were to take a lot of the biblical principles, I understand. I'm so glad God gave us three kids. But I'll tell you what, I don't know what he was doing. I didn't have a clue about anything. And somehow, our kids grew up and they didn't kill each other. And they, they loved Jesus. They loved the church. They loved each other. They loved their parents. I'll call that a win. And you know what, we, what helped was this little thing right here. Someone gave us this, this picture. This is a funnel. This is the parenting funnel. And basically you can see that um, the age goes up, and as the age goes up, the freedoms increase. Simple concept. When your kid's are little, my contention is we give too many freedoms to kids when they're young. Only give freedoms that are appropriate for their age and development and their capability. You're not doing them a favor by sort of getting ahead of the game. And generally, I think we give too many freedoms when kids are little, and they don't learn then about authority and boundaries, so that when they're older, you try to pull back and push them down the funnel. It doesn't feel good for anyone. You've got to stay in the funnel. So age zero to six, your main job is to establish authority. Who's the boss? It's good for them to know, to submit to authority, whether it's you, a teacher, a karate instructor, or anyone. Who's in charge at bedtime? When do they come for dinner? Require first-time obedience instead of having to call them 74 times. That does them a favor. It doesn't make your life easier, only it, it helps them. Don't give them too many responsibilities when they're young. Don't give them too many choices when they're young. Or that's what's called parenting outside the funnel. As kids move up in age, they, they get more responsibilities. As their ability to obey and show self-control. So ages 7 to 12, you're developing responsibility. Now, you know, bedtime looks different. There's no more naps, maybe. They, they can decide what to wear. But give, you're not teaching, you're equipping now. And give them responsibilities and chores and stuff to learn how to do stuff and to, to, to take the trash out, feed the dog, you know, clear the table, wash the dishes, clean their room, help in the yard. These are things that kids need to do. And, and then if you set something and they don't do it, give them consequences and follow through. That's your job. Don't have a kid-centric home. That's not doing anyone a favor. Age 13 and up, then we're into sort of a facilitating independence, right? This is where now they're more interested in their friends and their peers than they are you, frankly. And so you're going to help them as they face physical maturity and sexual interest and learning to drive and getting a job. All these exciting decisions now that we do want to let them make, they're going to make some mistakes, but they do it under your roof, under your guidance and tutelage, and that's the privilege we have. And we... what. What I see and what concerns me is so many people reverse the funnel. They think it's like helping some little toddler to give them all these choices. And then when the kids are older, they step in and do everything for them. And they never let them experience the sort of bumps and scrapes. They pay for everything. They bail them out. They, they, they don't ever let the, the kids sort of experience something. And that's our job, to let them do that. You hand a kid a world on a platter when they're teenagers, they get out of control. And then you try to regain it. It's a messy deal. So 
little, little, little toddler, you know, you want the pink or the orange sippy cup today? You, you, you want orange juice or apple juice in that, sweetie? You, you want the pants or the shorts? You want the blue ones or the green ones? You want sandals or tennis? And we think we're helping them become a good decision maker, and what we're doing is we're announcing you're in control of everything. Hey, by the way, it's lunchtime. Please pick up your toys. No. <laughs> Kidding me? I'm the boss of the universe, and I believe it's a direct result of too many choices. Jesus was swaddled up in swaddling clothes, held nice and tight when he was a baby, but they didn't keep him that way when he was a teenager. And, and that's because the funnel opens up, and I think... There's a beautiful empowerment that happens when you give a kid a choice at the right age. Sometimes it helps them know they're in control and you can help them make a decision. But too many choices too young just teaches them not to obey and to learn to respect authority. And it transfers the authority to the wrong place. So be careful about how you do that. Our job is to help kids grow up who can counter the culture of disrespect that we live in, who are not going to struggle. They're going to, if you give them too much freedom, they've got confusion. Too little, they've got frustration. Kids are morally, behaviorally, emotionally, intellectually, athletically, sexually, and physically rushed. Don't rush them. Let them live in the safety of the boundaries that you as a parent set. That's your job. And you don't have to give them a thousand choices on everything because it just adds confusion. What you do need to do is Help them to learn that other people have boundaries. Help them learn self-control, respect, obedience, trust, and love. That's the end of my rant. <laughs> Tucked conveniently at the end of my sermon. And speaking of boundaries, I have a boundary with time. So this sermon is over. <laughs> Let's pray. God, I ask that each of us would have a sense of how you have loved us with an everlasting love how you have been a good father. And sometimes it has hurt us, but you've never harmed us. You have loved us with a pure good love, and God, just help us know in our marriages, with our kids, with our families, know how to love like that. Teach us to set the boundaries that honor you and one another. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, friends, thanks for being here. Uh, listen, if you're a guest, we love having you here. We have a thing called New Here. Over there by Zach. See, see Zach, everybody? If you're new here, go hang out there for three or four minutes. He'll give you a gift, send you on your way. Also, if you were touched by God in some way, you would love some prayer for some issue in your family, or maybe you're ready to accept Christ and start living on his terms. Whatever it might be, right up here under the cross, someone will be there to meet you and pray with you right now after the service. And next week, we start a new series. It's called Dare to Dream, because there's a God dream inside of you that God has that's going to honor him and his kingdom. And there's a dream this church has, and we're going to unveil some of that starting next week, so be here. Let's close. If you'll stand, and let's close with this same uh, passage of Scripture from Deuteronomy we've been using every week. The Hebrew families would recite it every day together. We're going to recite it together. Are you ready to read it together? Let's read it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Wherever you go, live within the limits of God for His praise and glory. See you next week.